All right. Welcome back, everyone, to week five of the Protestant Reformation. Before we begin, I'm going to pin this back so it doesn't bug me the entire time. Um, this week, we are covering some of my favorite material, um, which we'll get to. Just to recap from last week, uh, we started talking about Luther, his break from the church, um, how he went from just sort of bringing up some things that he wanted the church to talk about to full on being a declared heretic, uh, how he was sheltered by Frederick the Wise, and that's how he evaded being captured and burned at the stake. Um, and we went over a little bit how the guy Andres Karlstadt um, was one of the first examples of someone who started taking the Reformation in a direction that Luther didn't want that was out of Luther's control. And um, we're going to spend the first half of today talking more about Luther and his theology um, and some of the more subtle changes that he made in theology that maybe the average Joe wouldn't have known about, um, but that I think are the most important. Um, and then also moving on to another reformer and uh, the mess kind of that he helped create. Um, in case you guys don't know me, my name is Danielle Kuhn. I'm the director of faith formation here at St. John's. Um, disclaimer, I am not an expert. I do not have a PhD on the Reformation. I would not be qualified to teach at a college level, but it is a topic and a time in history that I'm really passionate about and that I love a lot and I'm very interested in. So all that being said, um, let's get into it. So I want to take a moment to talk about Luther's translation of the Bible, because this is something that I think a lot of people get confused about. Um, when Luther was staying at the castle of Frederick the Wise in hiding, remember he is uh, disguised as George the Knight at this point, and he's married to a former nun. He wrote the first translation of the Bible in German. Um, he wanted to release the Bible to all the people. He wanted everyone to be able to read it and have access to it. And he truly believed that if he did this, everyone who was able to read the Bible would read it and come to the same theological conclusions that he did. Unfortunately, as we can plainly see today, and as it became plain to Luther within the span of really just a few months, this did not happen. Um, it's incredibly easy to read the Bible and interpret it in a multiplicity of different ways. Um, we understand very well today how vastly different people's interpretation of the Bible can be. So what exactly did Luther do to the Bible besides just translate it? We hear a lot about, oh yeah, the Protestant Bible is missing some books, um, some things have been changed around. Sometimes we hear that Luther took Revelation out, but then we look at Protestant Bibles today and Revelation's there, so let's clear all of that up. Um, in his translation of the Bible, his German translation, Luther did not take out completely any books. It's more appropriate to say that he did some rearranging of sorts. Um, so Luther moved seven Old Testament books to the appendix of the Old Testament, and he moved five New Testament books to be a, an appendix of the New Testament. The Old Testament books were the deuterocanonical books, deuterocanonical books, which are Tobit, Wisdom, Baruch, Sirach, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, and parts of Daniel and Esther. These books Luther wanted to kind of demote in status because um, they were not thought to have been written originally in uh, Greek or in Hebrew. They were thought to have originally been written in Greek. As such, um, Luther doubted if they were on, on par with the rest of the Old Testament. Now, at the time of Jesus, the Jewish scriptures included all of these books and they were considered part of the Jewish scriptures. 
In 70 AD, however, after the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed yet again, um, Jewish leaders kind of got together and were really making an effort to purge anything that wasn't purely 100% Jewish um, from their scriptures. So they identified the deuterocanonical books, thought, we're not sure if these were originally written in Hebrew, they're out of here. Now, the early Christians, when they first came up with the Bible and the canon of the Bible, the deuterocanonical books were in there, uh, but Luther still doubted. He didn't think they were quite on par. As it happens to, it worked out well for him because 1st and 2nd Maccabees are the scriptural support for the doctrine of purgatory. So, as Luther did away with that, which really had more to do with him wanting to do away with works um, and that kind of understanding of salvation, it worked out well for him to demote 1st and 2nd Maccabees to appendix level. Um, I just want to defend Luther a little bit here and say that he wasn't alone in thinking that the deuterocanonical books were uh, lesser than books of the Bible. St. Jerome, who produced the Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible, which was the one used for centuries, um, and who is a saint, he early in his life didn't think the deuterocanonical Old Testament books should be included in the Bible. However, he submitted to church authority, and when the council's rules, no, they do belong in the Bible, he was like, all right, I'm on board. And by the end of his life, he did uh, support those books, the deuterocanonical books being in the Old Testament. Um, but he considered them a little suspect at first, St. Jerome. All right, so what did he do in the New Testament? Um, Actually, before we move on, I just want to say, I think it's important to note that, you know, church fathers, St. Jerome is a church father. Uh, we can think of, um, you know, St. Augustine, um, St. Cyril, St. Basil, John Chrysostom, um, Athanasius, St. Ignatius. They weren't, it wasn't like everything they said was 100% um, error free. And just because they might have said things that had errors in them doesn't make them not saints. It doesn't make them disqualify them from being holy men and women. Um, you know, Michael, Le Michael Jordan could miss a layup sometimes. That doesn't mean that he was a bad basketball player. All right, so moving on to Martin Luther with the New Testament. The New Testament books that Luther relegated to appendix status were the letter of James, the letters of John, Hebrews, and Revelation. And this was for doctrinal reasons as well as uh, Luther really couldn't, he didn't know what to make of Revelation. Um, but a good number of these books just contradicted Luther's new theology. For example, James really strongly contradicts Luther's position on works not mattering at all. Um, Hebrews supports the existence of a priesthood. Yeah, like I said before, Luther just really didn't know what to make of Revelation. He didn't really understand it. Um, and he didn't think it contributed or had any doctrinal value. Interestingly enough, though, in his German translation, Revelation was the only book he decided to illustrate um, with wood carving illustrations. And it's interesting to think about why in Revelation you have a lot of images of the Antichrist. You have seven-headed beasts um, and you have dragons and devils and lots of kind of scary figures, the whore of Babylon. In his illustrations in the Bible he created, all of those evil creatures and icons get depicted with Catholic imagery. So it was a really powerful way of conveying the church, the Catholic church is the Antichrist. It is the whore of Babylon. It is the seven headed beast, the dragon. Um, an effective way to tell people, even those who couldn't read and couldn't read German, maybe were completely illiterate, to communicate the message that the Catholic church was the worst. Smart guy. Um, for all of Luther's deliberate cultivation and work on the new translation and format of the Bible, however, 
he very quickly learns that his idea that everyone's going to come to the same interpretation of the Bible, as long as he just sort of releases it and lets people have access to it, is not exactly correct. Um, Luther gets pretty upset when he hears about these different interpretations uh, that these other reformers take, and he has a lot of strong words. But it's hard for him when he realizes that this movement that he created and all this work that he put into this Bible, this German translation, which was meant to be given to the people as a gift so they could understand the true theology. It's hard when he does all this and he's like, you're going in the complete wrong direction. What are you guys doing? We're not being united. Um, and he's got disagreements with all these new uh, leaders in the Reformation. And he's confined to a castle and can't get out there and be in the public like these other people can because He's sort of the head heretic that everyone wants to kill. Must have been tough for him. So Luther thinks that Karlstadt, the guy we talked about last week, has having betrayed the Reformation, even going so far as to call him our worst enemy, which I think he says a little prematurely because people come later who seem maybe to be much greater enemies to Luther and Lutheranism. But Luther can't silence Karlstadt. Even once he gets driven out of Wittenberg, Karlstadt continues to kind of roam about the Holy Roman Empire, um, preaching on his version of theology. And just like he couldn't completely silence Karlstadt, he couldn't completely silence all these other people that started popping up everywhere. What begins to happen next reflects the importance of interpretation of the Bible. To say that people will read it and all come to generally the right conclusion is to ignore the vast, vast amount of historical precedent that speaks otherwise. It's not like Luther was the first person to interpret the Bible a different way. Um, he was the first person to successfully not be burned at the stake and then create a whole movement. Neither I nor the Catholic Church supports people being burned at the stake for that. I think it's just important to say. Um, but it wasn't a new thing. To interpret the Bible on one's, by one, one's own self is a very powerful thing and can be a very powerful tool. It can also be something that you then weaponize and kind of use to manipulate, whether you know you're weaponizing it or not. Um, when you have access to a really sacred or revered text and you can create your own interpretation, there's always going to be the possibility that that access is yeah, used to manipulate and control other people and drive them to do what you would like them to do. And I'm not saying that the reformers were purposefully doing this, but when everyone is open to their own interpretation, it's very easy for your interpretation to suit your desires and your own beliefs and your own opinions so that the truth and the conclusions you arrive at are ones suited to your own preset desires. Luther's intentions to give all people access to the Bible, I think, are very good. It's a good thing for everyone to be able to read the Bible. That's definitely a wonderful thing. But the church did have legitimate reasons for wanting to protect the Bible and being a little bit cautious about saying just anyone can read it. It's kind of a difficult line to toe because when anyone can read it, they can come to their own conclusions, conclusions that may or may not be really harmful or very wrong. Um, but also, you want people to have access to the Word of God. So, I don't have answers. I don't have perfect answers. But um, all this to say, Luther had legitimate reasons for wanting everyone to be able to read the Bible. The Catholic Church had legitimate reasons for being cautious about everyone reading the Bible. It's kind of like access to the Bible is a superpower. Just like with Spider-Man, when he gets a superpower, with his great power comes great responsibility. That's like with the Bible. You get great power, but also great responsibility. And newsflash, not everyone's responsible. So sometimes it gets misused. Okay, moving on from that. 
Um, we're going to talk for a little bit uh, about Luther's account of the will. Um, and we're starting with Luther, Luther's account of the will because Luther's account of free will, or the lack thereof, is vital for understanding his view of the secular world. And understanding his view of the secular world is vital for understanding how he reacts to these radical reformers who start using the Reformation um, and reinterpreting passages of the Bible to spur political reform and revolution. So we're moving towards why Luther reacted so vehemently against uh, radical reformers that pushed for revolution. But we're starting with his view on free will because we have to know that first to understand how to get to why he got so angry at the people who pushed for a more radical reformation. Luther's account of the will is complex. Um, and really, when we start talking about free will in theology and philosophy, it requires kind of a good deal of technical language. And it just gets very particular. Every word matters. I am not going to go that deeply into technical language, lest it become dry, dull, and I lose everyone. Um, so I just want to say at the offset that this is going to be a simplified version of Luther's account of free will, and in addition, a simplified version of the Catholic account of oh, that's a mic. The Catholic account of free will, um, for brevity's sake. But there's a lot further complexities to that could be gone into. Okay, so Luther needs to change his account of free will because he rejects works as having any part in salvation. Um, he writes what he would call his magnum opus, the bondage of the will on free will, and he considers it to be his most important work of everything he does, including his German translation of the Bible. This is his most important piece of writing. In it, Luther argues that humans are responsible for all sin, but we do not have free will. Luther thought that um, everything must be completely under God's will, including which humans go to heaven and which humans go to hell, or else God was not God. He wasn't all powerful. Luther needs God to be all powerful, so he must be in control of everything, meaning humans don't have free will, including uh, he must be in control of everything, including what humans go to hell, what humans go to heaven. The Catholic view, which I'll bring up real quick here. The Catholic view was and is that sin weakened the will, weakened free will, and made it harder to choose God. It made us in need of his help, his grace. But we do freely choose good or evil. That's on us. In Luther's view, sin completely destroyed free will. So um, actually, before I put those up. In Luther's view, sin completely destroys free will so that it's completely gone. We have no ability to choose good or evil. We only choose evil all the time. Um, and his work on the bondage of the will really alludes to this complete destruction of mankind's free will with the fall. It was published in 1525. Um, and yeah, Luther declared it to be the heart of the Reformation. Luther sees all parts of man as fallen, his will, his intellect, and his passions. Um, and thus there was absolutely no part of him that could participate in salvation. There's no part of him that could have any role in his salvation. Um, and that our will is not free. We talk a lot about free will in Catholicism, so this might be kind of a shock to Catholics to hear that Luther is like, no, we don't actually have free will. Um, but why he does this rests on the original thrust of where his reformation came from. Remember his scrupulosity. He's tormented by the idea when he's a monk that he's not perfect. He sins in all these different ways. And no matter how hard he tries, he still sins. So he's really tormented by the fact that he cannot 
completely get rid of sin in his life. So part of his solution to this is to say, works don't matter. Humanity's doing good things doesn't matter. Humanity sinning doesn't really matter because our wills are not free. Um, when he says that we have no free will, it alleviates this problem of why am I constantly sinning? Why do I constantly choose evil when I want to choose good? What's happening with me? Oh, I don't have free will. None of this is really on me. Whereas the Catholic view says, no, no, you just have a weakened will. Your will is kind of really bad at being a free will. It keeps choosing evil because it's really weak and it needs God's grace. But you're still responsible for choosing evil. You're also still responsible to, for all the things that you choose that are good. Um, so, Luther did believe, uh, I should say, Luther did believe that we had free will in matters that were earthly. So, like money or what clothes you want to buy or what you want to eat or drink. We have free will in those matters. We just don't have any free will in terms of our salvation. That's utterly decided by God and the devil, as he will say. He writes... So man's will is like a beast standing between two riders. If God rides, it wills and goes where God wills. If Satan rides, it wills and goes where Satan wills. Nor may it choose to which rider it will run or which it will seek. But the riders themselves fight to decide who shall have and hold it. See, in this passage, he says, nor may it choose to which rider it will run or which it will even seek. He's saying the human humanity has absolutely no choice in if they seek the devil or if they seek God, if they seek evil or if they seek good. They are controlled or like he says, ridden by either God or Satan. And that's just how it is. Uh, one analogy that a professor of mine used during my undergrad was think of a train. Imagine men and women in a train. Um, they can choose, they can choose what box they go to. They can go from one box to another. They can move from maybe the dining car to the lounge car to their, uh, business class seat, but they can't choose the direction that the train's going. That's kind of like Luther's view on the will. You can kind of move around in the world and choose between different earthly stuff, but where your train is going to God or to the devil you have no influence over that and you can't do anything about it. Uh, this is a belief in double predestination. Sometimes some Catholics may have heard that uh, Catholics don't believe in predestination. We actually do. We do believe in predestination. We believe that every single human being is predestined to be in heaven with God. That's what we were made for. That's what God predestined us for. When God creates each human being, each human being is predestined for heaven. Does that mean that human being will go to heaven? Not necessarily. It just means that's where they should go. That's where God wants them to go. Um, Protestants like Luther and Calvin, I shouldn't say all Protestants because some Protestant denominations would disagree with this. Some Protestant denominations really don't even think about this and don't have any view on this and kind of just like don't have this aspect of theology. Um, but Luther and Calvin and like the early Protestant reformers uh, believed in double predestination, which means that God predestines each person to either go to heaven or to go to hell. Each person is predestined, preset in one of those directions. And that's double predestination and Catholics do not believe in that. No one is destined to go to hell. Um, that's what Catholics believe. <clears throat> Need some water. Uh, Luther actually writes uh, the bondage of the will in response to Erasmus. If we remember Erasmus from our episode number three on humanism, Erasmus wrote a work on human on free will, defending the Catholic notion of free will. Luther did not like it. Because when you defend the Catholic notion of free will, works matter. Because in the very least, 
it matters that you accept God's salvation. You have to do that. You do have to accept God's free gift of grace to you. Um, and that is a work that you have to do. It doesn't mean you earn your salvation, but it means you do have to accept it. God's not going to force anything on you. It doesn't matter. For Luther, it's still a work. He doesn't want to have any works. He doesn't want to have humans involved at all. Salvation is just something that's kind of put upon a human being. Uh, so he writes the bondage of the will in response to Erasmus and declares Erasmus is not even a Christian because of Erasmus's first writing defending free will. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to bring this back up now just to clarify things. I hope this clarifies things. Catholic view of free will in terms of salvation, justification, sanctification. As Catholics, we believe that salvation is a free gift of grace from God, which does require our cooperative assent. So do we earn our salvation? No, not by any means. Nothing we do, no work, no good work of ours can earn our salvation. Salvation is a free gift of God to us. However, we have to choose to open the gift. We have to accept it. God doesn't force anything upon us. Um, he's not going to save us unless we're okay with it. We have to say yes. <clears throat> uh, the Luther or Protestant view is that salvation is through faith alone and humanity has no role whatsoever. So not even in acceptance. Um, again, like Luther says in that quote, humanity has no choice about its rider or which rider it seeks out. Justification. Uh, Catholics believe that justification is through Christ's cross just like Protestants do. But also, again, we have to accept this justification. It's not just automatically conferred to us. God is always respecting our free will and waiting for us to accept it. Um, the Protestant or Luther's view is kind of more legalistic. Justification through Christ's cross is kind of like, through his cross, Jesus signed a document which automatically conferred on everyone justification. So everyone's justified. Not everyone's saved, though, um, according to the view of double predestination. Some are just destined to go to hell. Um, the difference there, again, is Catholics have a more active role of humans' free will, whereas because Luther doesn't think we have free will, um, Protestant justification is, yeah, more legalistic. Like, God signed the dotted line, and then everyone was automatically justified. And lastly, there's sanctification. This is actually not really a Protestant thing at all. Sanctification um, is a Catholic doctrine. We say we're all called to sanctification, which means we have the ability to grow closer to and actually grow more like Christ. So basically, you could summarize this by saying like Catholics think we can improve our souls. We can grow holier we can grow closer to God. And as we grow closer to him, we become more conformed to his will. And um, that's where importance of things like, yeah, going to mass as often as you can and daily prayer, um, pilgrimages, immersing yourself in holy art, all of those things can be involved in sanctification because they bring you closer to Christ. Luther's view is, um, he's famously associated with, although it's a little disputed whether he actually said this, but he's famously associated with saying that humanity are like balls of dung coated in snow. So the justification of God and God's grace is like the snow coating us who are balls of dung. So Luther doesn't believe we can be sanctified because we're balls of dung and there's nothing good within us. Remember, we have a totally fallen and corrupted will, passions, and intellect. Um, therefore, we cannot be sanctified. Again, this really works well with Luther's theology because he's completely against works. Works are required for sanctification because you must actively continue to choose God and more closely align, align your own free will with God. Uh, you can't do that if you don't have free will. So sanctification is not really a thing in uh, Lutheran or Protestant views, which is, you know, a very big difference between Catholics and Protestants. Um, if you're Catholic, I know a lot of people think that confirmation is like the Catholic graduation, but it's not. It's really, really not. Um, 
your whole life should be about growing closer to Christ. And that means practicing the sacraments, trying to improve in prayer. Um, faith is a journey that is never over because you're never going to be perfect. So you're always called to reach more for Christ. There's never a point where you're like, all right, I'm holy enough. I'm good. We don't have to do anything. I'm just, I'm happy right here. I'm fine. I don't want to move. That's not a thing in Catholicism. We should always be working to grow closer to Christ because we always have that call of sainthood. In Protestantism, because it's kind of like you're either saved or you're not saved, there's not a lot to do after you determine that you're saved because you can't be... Sanctification is not, uh, not a thing in, for most Protestant denominations. I don't want to say all because there's just a lot, so I could be missing one that does have sanctification, but in general you can't really do anything to improve your soul. So you just hang out. Um, okay. So let's talk about some troublesome consequences of Luther's view of free will. Free will is like my theological obsession. It's the thing I love most to read about theologically and philosophically. Uh, and I, it's so, so utterly important in Catholic theology. Without free will, you don't have a theology of hell. You don't have a theology of evil. You don't have a theology of love. You don't have a theology, a Catholic theology at least, of sanctification and justification. So free will is huge. If you don't have free will, so much changes. Um, so Luther's little writing on the bondage of the will, not widely read, not widely known to the public. It's not like most people when they were switching from Catholicism to Lutheranism were like, oh yeah, now I don't have free will. Now I believe that I don't have free will. You know, it's kind of already a little bit of a tougher philosophical or theological notion to think about. So it's not like the masses were thinking about how they no longer had free will. Um, it was a much more subtle, abstract theological change that Luther made, but it did and continues to have really big ramifications. Um, if sin destroys free will, that changes a lot how you view yourself, how you view God, how you view other people around you. I want to reference uh, a little bit the book by Max Weber. He lived uh, turn of the century, 1864 to 1920, and he wrote this book called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. The thrust of this book is that capitalism, in the, or the modern version of capitalism in the Western world, was largely a product of a Protestant work ethic, a Protestant ethic. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of economic stuff that he talks about, and I'm not so much interested, I wasn't so much interested in that when we read it and learned about it. Um, the much more fascinating uh, central thesis of his book for me was that part of this Protestant ethic was when you take away human free will and salvation, Humanity still grasps for something, if subconsciously, for something as a sign to know that they are saved. You still want to have some kind of marker. You want to have that control, just like we talked about with uh, Catholics in late medieval piety, reaching for all these different pilgrimages and relics and tactile things by which they could feel like they're in control of their salvation. That desire doesn't just go away when you convert from Catholicism to Protestantism. People still had that, but they no longer had any of those um, lay spiritual practices because those were completely done away with. So Weber argues that there is this great turning to looking at the secular world and exterior factors in the secular world as a sign by which you can know that you're saved. And one of the biggest signs is wealth, um, how successful you are, if you have a good position among the people, um, you know, if your business does well, if your farm does well. In general, if life is going well for you, that's a sign that you're saved. Um, 
And Weber argues that it's that looking, that grasping for some kind of exterior signal that you are saved since you don't have any interior control over anything, since you don't have free will, that drives um, the beginning of Western capitalism as we know it, because there's this drive for a greater accrual of wealth, a greater accrual of success, because it just means you have a greater sign that you're saved. Um, that is not to say that people think that uh, overtly. Weber's whole argument is that this is a subconscious thought process and people always have this desire for control and wanting to know and feel secure. <clears throat> but I think it's a really interesting thesis because, uh, I mean, I do agree that people never lose that desire to feel like they are in control of their life. And um, he has a whole historical analysis that's really good if you want to look into that book. It's very, very interesting. It was kind of a big seminal moment for his time period, influenced later thinkers, surprisingly later communist thinkers um, like Marx. Anyways, I digress. Oh, one last troublesome part of Luther's view on the will is that it can create and has been argued that it creates in some societies a lack of compassion for those who are struggling. So if you are a Protestant townsperson, you believe that you are either predestined for hell or predestined for heaven, and you are looking for those exterior signals of whether you're saved or not. When you look at the town prostitutes, when you look at the town addicts, when you look at the town drunks or the town gamblers, and you look at all the exterior signs of their life, sure looks like their rider is the devil. And if their rider is the devil, you can't do anything about it. They can't do anything about it. It means that they've already been predestined to hell. So we will just shun them. This we'll see later when we have different sects of uh, Protestant denominations who adopt a practice of shunning. If someone does something really bad, they're just shunned from the community uh, because it's a sign that they've been predestined for hell. You can't do anything about it. They can't do anything about it. So let's just keep them away from the good Christians who have been saved. Again, not an overt practice that Luther had in mind or wanted, but a consequence of this a psychological ramification of when you have this view on the will and kind of a logical one too. All right, moving from this onto Luther's view of the secular world. I spent too much time on the will. <sighs> okay. So Luther's, Luther in the secular world, because Luther has this view that you're either saved or you're not saved, for all those who are not saved, who are not Christians, Luther calls them wild, savage beasts. Um, and they can't be changed. So what do we have to protect the good Christians from them? We have the secular law. So Luther's really big on the secular law and secular rulers being necessary to keep the saved Christians protected from the wild, savage beasts who are destined for hell. He sees secular rulers as kind of an unfortunate but necessary thing that we have to have because there are all of these savage wild beasts roaming about the world. Um, we need something to protect the good Christians. They have to protect the saved people from the damned people. Um, he says that the world would burn in the fiery chaos if we did not have our secular rulers. So from this position, he is very passionate about defending rulers. Now, it's disputable, it's debatable if Luther really truly felt this way, or again, he was kind of falling back on that conservatism where he's like, I want this reformation to succeed. It's not gonna succeed unless I have secular rulers protecting me and on my side. Therefore, I'm throwing my hat in with the nobles. Um, when we talk about Thomas Munzer at the end of today's class, um, that's going to be the dividing line. Thomas Munzer and these more radical reformers throw their hat in with the poor, with the repressed, um, 
and Luther sides with the rulers and says, no, we need these rulers, even if they are oppressive sometimes. Luther believed that worldly law cannot effectively correct Christians. Christians are already saved. Their wills are already directed to God. Nothing can change that because God's in charge of that. So the secular law doesn't really exist for Christians, but it is very necessary for keeping those other human beings whose wills are directed towards the devil, and they can't do anything about that, from smiting and kind of uh, getting, getting in the way of the Christians. External law, that is secular law, can only correct external actions. It can't change your interior because your interior will is not free. It can't be changed in the first place. So Luther looks at secular law very pragmatically. Like, yeah, it's not the greatest thing, but we kind of need it because otherwise the wild savage beasts are there. It's also important to note that the Reformation was a time when people are really afraid of chaos and they're really afraid of instability. So um, as all of this breaking apart of a unified church happens, people are afraid because there's so much upheaval. I mean, this is a religion that had been going on for 1500 years and all and the, the cultural practices, the heritage, the traditions, the family lineage was very ingrained. And for all of this Reformation stuff to be happening over the course of, you know, five years, it really sped up very quickly for the time period, was very disorienting for people. So amidst all of this, they really do have a desire for some kind of order. And Luther wants to support and uh, placate that desire for order, not increase it. One example of this is how he keeps infant baptism. So Luther does believe that you need faith for baptism to be efficacious. And the baby can't have faith. So Luther is like, well, okay, we are going to have to have adult baptism. He comes to that conclusion, but he doesn't outright say that. To the public, he still supports infant baptism because if he had tried to get rid of infant baptism, it would have caused utter chaos. At the time, how you were made a legitimate citizen, how you kind of, yeah, how you gained official citizenship was by being baptized. If you died unbaptized, you couldn't be buried in, in the cemetery with the other baptized people. There were certain other things that you didn't have a right to if you weren't baptized. So for him to say, oh, if you are baptized as a baby, it's not legit, everybody would freak out because all of a sudden they're like, oh, my citizenship is not guaranteed. I'm not going to be buried in the right cemetery. And then we'd have thousands of people flocking to priests to get rebaptized. It would be chaotic, long lines everywhere. Long lines create cranky people. Cranky people are not into joining the Reformation. So Luther doesn't come out and say that we have to um, be baptized as adults, even though it's more in line with his theology, because he's trying to prevent the chaos. And in this next interaction between Luther and Thomas Munzer, what he's doing is trying to prevent the chaos. So radical reformers. Like Karl Stott, who interpreted the Bible and developed a theology different from Luther's, there was a lot of other people um, who kind of did the same thing, and they fought back against Luther's message to play nice with the politicians. They started supporting and propagating an idea that would lead to a lot of political instability in Europe. And this idea was that God's law is above all human law, Therefore, rulers are all subject to God. And like some of this sounds, oh yeah, rulers should be subject to God. But what this was used to kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Rile up in the people was that we should overturn the rulers if they are doing things that are oppressive. So it was inciting rebellion. This is not me making a commentary on whether these rebellions should or should not have happened. I'm just saying this idea that God's law was above secular law pushed a lot of peasants 
to rise up against their rulers. And in 1524 through 1525, we had what are called the German Peasant Wars. Oh, oh. Um, German Peasant Wars is a bit of a misnomer because they weren't just relegated to the area that is now Germany. They occurred, you know, in the northern Italy and what's now Switzerland and what's now Austria, um, Prussia. It was everywhere, but they just called the, they're just called the German Peasants' War or the German Peasant Rebellion sometimes. Um, and this was a big deal. The largest armed peasant upri uprising that Europe ever has ever seen. Um, I think 300,000 peasants joined in it across the land, which was a lot. Um, they were driven by this idea that Christians, true Christians, should not be told by the government how to act, and if the government was being oppressive, they should overthrow them. Honestly, not that crazy an idea, right? It's in, a lot of revolutions are based on that idea. But Luther is against it because it's gonna create chaos and it's gonna create disorder, and then people will not be into the Reformation as much, especially rulers. We gotta keep the rulers happy because they are the ones who are keeping us from being dead. So, um, one guy I want to talk about who is a lot of fun is Thomas Munzer. We'll put him up here. This is a picture of Thomas Munzer talking to peasants. Inciting rebellion. Thomas Munzer was part of a group called the Zwickau Prophets, and he was from Switzerland. Uh, and Thomas believed that he was a divinely inspired prophet bringing new revelation to the people. He is a very colorful man, and I love reading his writing because he does not hold anything back. He has a lot of strong words for Luther. Really does not like him. Um, he says that Luther makes a mockery and an utterly useless babble out of the divine word. The godless one, Luther, drags Paul around with such an idiotic comprehension that even to a child it becomes as ridiculous as a puppet show. And frankly, this quote is tame for Munzer. Munzer was a reformer convicted that he had a prophetic mission from God. He was not just a normal priest. He was, he was like a, a new Elijah meant to inspire the people to bring God's kingdom on earth. He mocked the, quote, donkey fart doctors of theology, end quote, Really, you can see his disparaging attitudes towards not just Catholic priests, but all pastors here. He believed you were not a legitimate pastor unless you were inspired by the Spirit. And also, conveniently, he was the only one he knew who was inspired by the Spirit. So he called them doc donkey fart doctors of theology and, quote, diarrhea makers who led only with the Bible's word instead of with his own mystical calling. He had the prophetic mission. He was divinely chosen. Um, he had a very, very apocalyptic outlook, which was why he was very good at inciting people to do things they might not otherwise do if they didn't think the world was about to end. Uh, he very much believed that the end of the world was imminent and that uh, as he incited these peasants to rise up, that Jesus would appear among them as they were fighting and join with them and help them overcome uh, these nobles that were oppressing them. So Munzer thought that the spiritual elect, and this was the most radical thing about Munzer, Munzer thought that the spiritual elect could only be found in the poor and downtrodden. So anyone who lived comfortably, anyone who was wealthy, and definitely anyone who was a ruler was part of the damned. They were evil and corrupt and should be smited. Um, a lot of, again, later, communist Marxist writers look to Munzer and the German Peasants' War as a proto-communist movement because Munzer especially incited these peasants saying, you are God's chosen, you are the elect, these others are evil, corrupted, and we must kill them, he says. The elect must clash with the damned, and the power of the damned must yield before that of the elect. Oh, how ripe are the rotten apples! 
The time of the harvest is at hand. Thus God himself has appointed me for the harvest. I have made sh my sickle sharp. Um, and he means kill. He, he meant violence. He, again, he also viewed these people as being destined for hell and nothing they could do to, would change that and nothing that the elect could do would change that. So they must be killed. There's kind of a lot of that viewpoint that goes around like, oh, these people are damned. These people are going to hell no matter what. We can't do anything for them. So we shall kill them. Luther will also display that attitude shortly. Um, however, in general, Luther thought that uh, those who were destined for hell should just be ignored by Christians. Like, we shouldn't be killing them. Just kind of pity them, ignore them, do your best to kind of walk around them if you can. But Munzer very much promoted a rising up and slaying of the people who were not the elect. He didn't see anything wrong with killing them because they were damned. So again, Thomas Munzer was not the leader of the German Peasants' War. He was not the sole cause of it, but he was definitely an instigator, definitely um, someone who fanned the flames of the fire. The German Peasants' War was the largest mass uprising in the history of Europe. Um, the peasant unrest had been brewing for a while because of a lot of legalistic changes during that time period. The Holy Roman Emperor, Empire was trying to move back to Roman law and they were displacing all these old feudal systems. Feudal systems had more of a agreement between serf and master. It was more like, oh, I'm gonna give you this and in return, you're gonna give me this. So it was more of a trade type system, even if the serf got kind of the suckier end of the trade. Roman law is very much there are slaves and there are legitimate people who have rights. Like that's how Roman law was, that's how it worked. Um, so when the Holy Roman Empire tried to institute that again, serfs kind of fell into the category of being slaves and then their masters were the legitimate people who actually had rights. And serfs did not like being placed in the category of slaves. It did not benefit them at all. And um, they got mad about it because of all these new laws that were coming in that really negatively affected them. Um, so the peasants were not happy. The situation was ripe for an uprising. Unfortunately, it's not well coordinated at all, unsurprisingly for this time period when, when it's peasants who are uprising. Uh, not well coordinated at all, very bloody and costly. I mean, they were slayed. They were just, they didn't stand a chance against the rulers who had organized armies, trained men. It was a slaughter. Munzer incited them, but Luther admonished them, telling them that just because their rulers were unjust did not mean that they were justified in killing and in violence, which is ironic because of what he says later. So Luther admonishes the peasants, says, just because your ruler's unjust, you don't get to kill them, all right? There's no reason for violence here. He writes a strongly worded letter called Against the Murderous, Thieving Hordes of Peasants. Um, and although this admonition was not strong enough to stop the violence, it did have the effect of inciting others to become violent against the rebels. So the German peasants who were being violent didn't change anything for them, but it did encourage others to be violent towards the peasants, uh, which is not surprising when you see what Luther wrote. Oh wait, oh no, that's another monster quote. Here we go. He says, let everyone who can smite, slay and stab secretly and openly, remembering that nothing can be more poisonous, hurtful or devilish than a rebel. See how strongly he comes out against being a rebel, being someone who is causing chaos and revolting against rulers. It is just as when one must kill a mad dog. If you do not strike him, he will strike you and a whole land with you. Stab, smite, slay whoever can. If you die in doing it well for you, 
A more blessed death can never be yours, for you die in obeying the divine word and commandment in Romans 13, and in loving service of your neighbor, who you are rescuing from the bonds of hell and of the devil. There's a lot of things in this response. There's a lot that's inconsistent with Luther's theology. For instance, when he says, if you die in doing it well for you, a more blessed death can never be yours, that really seems to make it, it, it makes it seem like there are some deaths that are more blessed than others, as if there are some deeds that are more blessed than others, which is very contrary to Luther's position on works meaning nothing and having no merit. Um, and then, of course, he's telling the rebels that they shouldn't be violent while also telling other people that they should kill all the rebels. This does a lot of permanent damage to Luther's reputation. He is remembered for a very long time for saying that anyone who is a rebel is a mad dog. People do not like it when you side with the government, when you side with the oppressor when you side with the ruler who is being unjust. And Luther is remembered for a long time for how he sided with the ruler, for how he incited violence against the rebels, the oppressed people, um, and told the oppressed people that they themselves should not be violent. This was not a good PR, for, uh, PR moment for Luther. And it did not... Um, stand up to the test of time very well at all. But really, at the end of the day, Luther just wants Germany to stay stable, because if it did not, he did not think that the Reformation would survive, and he thought it would fail as a movement. So he feels like he's in a corner here. The Germans peasants, the German Peasants' Revolution War is a really big moment for the Reformation though, because it takes the power of the Reformation out of the hands of the people and puts it in the rulers. The peasants are slaughtered. The rulers crush them. So not only is the power of the rulers strengthened, but the rulers are much more on guard. Nobles, kings, they're looking at this reformation with a lot more fear now. We need to be careful. We need to make sure we're watching these new reformation leaders. We need to make sure no one's inciting groups of peasants against us. Um, rulers feel a lot more of a desire to control and make sure they are a part of the big decisions in the reformation. The period of time when all of this was very dominated by movements of the people or by theologians or strictly the religious is over. Because secular, the secular powers that be are like, you are affecting my life now, so I need to get involved. I need to make sure I'm a part of the situation so we don't have any more peasants wars. Well, I mean, which is understandable. Um, John of Saxony, who actually succeeds Frederick the Wise, would set up the first state church in 1527, which became the model for Lutheran churches. Lutheran churches were controlled by the state. There would be a, a secular ruler that would be in charge of them, which is very ironic if you think about the roots of the Reformation um, and all the unrest that came from the corruption that occurred in the hierarchy of the Catholic Church when secular rulers got involved with the appointing of bishops. Now we see that Lutheran churches would have civil lords in control of them. But to Luther, he sees it as the safest option, the thing that's going to keep his reformation alive. He needs to have some allies because it sure feels to him at this point like he doesn't have a lot of friends. The group of reformers, the group of Protestants that was at one point all united behind him are now dispersing in all different directions. And he's realizing that just because you are against the Catholic Church doesn't mean you are on his side. You might still be an enemy um, who, like Munzer, I had to include some of these. Munzer just has such amazing quotes. Munzer called him 
Luther, brother soft life, the godless flesh at Wittenberg, father pussyfoot, arch heathen, arch devil, rabid burning fox. And those are really just a few of my favorites there. Um, no, that's not his. And then I, I created this, I, or I put this in earlier. You want to make God responsible for the fact that you are a poor sinner and a venomous little worm with your bleep humility. So, yes, Luther realized quite quickly that just because you were a leader in the Reformation does not mean you were going to be a fan of Luther's. You might think instead that he is a brother soft life. Fantastic. I highly recommend that everyone read some of Thomas Munzer's letters. They are very colorful. He's passionate and it shows. Uh, Thomas Munzer, if anyone was wondering, did die in the German Peasants' War. Um, so didn't, didn't go well for him. Anyways, yeah, we're gonna end there. Uh, Thomas Munzer, German Peasants' War, power of the Reformation, rulers are taking it and holding on to it because they're nervous about the chaos breaking out. And Luther kind of allows this to happen and even encourages it because he think, thinks that with the rulers, with the secular powers, that is where his reformation will be safest and be most protected. I don't know if I drink water enough for questions, the questions that never come, but I'm still giving people the opportunity. Um, but if you have a question, want to talk about free will, or any other queries, um, this is my email, danielc at johnthebaptist.org. Otherwise, I will see you guys all next week. We're going to start talking about the Swiss Reformation. And I say Swiss, Swiss Reformation because it kind of goes in a number of different directions. And uh, it's pretty fun. Swiss Reformation is fun. Thank you all for tuning in. And I will see you guys later next week.